Hello and welcome to another Atippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a frontline update for the 27th of December 2022. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, I guess, before I start. Uh, some people have been saying, oh, you know, spit it out, get, get a move on, get your words out. Uh, just to remind some people who don't know, most of my regular viewers know this, I have primary progressive multiple sclerosis and one of the symptoms of this is the inability to get my words out sometimes. I can't choose the right words, I forget particular words. And this is a stream of consciousness video, so I prepare my tabs, but I don't know what I'm going to say, I just say it when I say it. I don't have time to script because I do a bunch of videos on this a day. I try and do other philosophical stuff. I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, and I have a part-time day job as well. So. I'm an incredibly busy person. This is what it is. I'm sorry if if, if you don't like it. Uh, there are plenty of places on YouTube to offer scripted stuff or whatever. Um, some, someone said, I looked really scruffy the other day on Christmas Day. Uh, that was the neatest I'd looked all year. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. I am who I am. Um, you know, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, I'm sorry. Uh, but I will, I do struggle. I do lots of ums and ahs. My biggest piece of advice is listen to me on 1.5 or 1.75. I am so much better on 1.5. Just there are no pauses. I absolutely slam through everything with uh, great speed. It's fantastic. Anyway, there you go. Uh, welcome to the Frontline Update. Let's talk about overnight news. Let's go to the figures released by Ukraine usual caveats and I had to I had to argue this again in a thread yesterday why don't you produce Ukrainian death numbers there are no Ukrainian death numbers the Russians don't release them the Ukrainians don't release them for propaganda reasons so I can only give you the Ukrainian stats for the Russians like I don't know how many times I have to say this and also usual caveats inaccuracy propaganda we can't we don't know exactly how they create these numbers, how they top them up. So all the caveats, but as I say again and again, these are indicative, uh, they're useful for me to to let me know that yes, it was a good or bad day for the Russians, generally speaking, and the figures might be inaccurate to a certain percentage, whatever. So liquidated personnel is according to the Ukrainians, 620. So a little bit of an uptick, seven APCs, two artillery systems, five vehicles and fuel tanks and one piece of special equipment. I would say that's a fairly quiet day on the equipment front with a slight uptick in uh, stats for liquidated personnel. Um, is that any great indication of anything? Probably not. Just a bit of a meh day, uh, I guess, statistically speaking. What else has happened overnight? Uh, well, actually, before I go there, let's let's just go to the ISW who talks about Putin. Now, Putin was reported in the sort of mainstream media as saying he's open for negotiations. And that was all really big news for the last couple of days. I didn't mention that at all. I was a bit, meh. Uh, it turns out that, well, according to the ISW, he didn't really say that, actually. And he did not offer to negotiate with the Ukraine on Christmas Day. He, as they say, Putin did not explicitly state that Russia was ready to negotiate directly with Ukraine, instead maintaining his false narrative that Ukraine, which is simply called the other side, had violated Russia's pre-invasion diplomatic efforts. Putin's discussions and negotiations have focused on putative discussions with the West rather than with the Ukraine and reflect his continual accusations that Ukraine is merely a Western pawn with no real agency. And this kind of fits in with the narrative that there is no Ukraine, Ukraine shouldn't exist, blah, blah, blah. And it's like extracting any sense of or, or negating any sense of agency, as the ISW say, uh, that Ukraine have. Uh, Russia just doesn't really see them. Um, Putin also stated that he thinks Russia is operating in a correct direction, which indicates he's not set serious conditions for negotiations and still wishes to pursue his maximalist goals. Um, and they go on to say Putin's tw uh, December 25th statement is part uh, of a deliberate information campaign aimed at misleading the West to push Ukraine into making preliminary concessions. So kind of it's, it's on the other, it's, it's a bit of a flip there that actually they're not ready to make concessions, but they want to force Ukrainians to make making concessions. The problem is the battlefield the scenario or situation indicates otherwise, really. Um, Russia are struggling somewhat, it has to be said. Uh, Putin is likely concerned over the lack of support for his war in Ukraine among elites and may be setting information conditions for the nationalisation of their property. Wow, that could be huge. 
Um, so they're getting slammed. The elites, well, the rich oligarchs are getting sanctioned on the one hand by the West and then uh, getting uh, har harassed potentially by the Russians themselves on the other hand. So there you go. OK, uh, as we move further on to the general sort of news, this has been reported by a number of different Russian sources. Four Ukrainian servicemen have been killed in Russia on the 26th of December. A group of four Ukrainian saboteurs died on the territory of Russia in Bryansk Oblast during a combat mission, uh, Russia's FSB reported. Now, this might have nothing to do with the strike on Engels Air Base. Just to remind you that uh, Engels Air Base is in Saratov, which is just over here. Now, some people are saying that in order for those Tupolev rocket drones to be effective, you need people positioned in Russia in order for that, that to work. It might be that those four people who have been killed, if indeed they have, were part of that kind of setup. It could be that, that they were the people involved in, uh, in the drone strikes on that Russian airbase. That, however, is somewhat unlikely given that Bryansk Oblast is over here, as you can see the uh, city of Bryansk there. So you'd unlikely have four saboteurs captured uh, and, and killed over here, sorry, um, and then being used for a drone strike over in Saratov. So highly unlikely. However, it is interesting to think that there must be some Ukrainian, either pro-Ukrainian, I don't, I don't know, saboteurs working or, or partisans working within Russia or actual Ukrainian units working deep within Russia. OK, uh, carry on. Uh, Tim White says, more extraordinary uh, tales of looting by Russia's rabble of an army. Chechens are said to be stealing literally anything, including mobile phone masks, as they move through villages in Zaporizhia. This uh, translated post from Telegram channel um, in Melitopol. So the occupiers continue to loot the occupied territories of the Zaporizhia region. The other day, the people of Kadyrov, uh, so these are the Chechens, left the village of Obilnoy, uh, Melitopol district. The soldiers of the Second World War took with them all the property that was in the houses of, lo uh, of local residents where they lived. They took away everything looted by cars, household appliances, things, and even dishes. Bare walls were left behind in the houses. Fences were dismantled, dismantled. arches were cut. And we were told that Putin had given them permission. And this is true as well. So Putin has said that any crimes committed in kind of in the in advancement of the Russian objectives in the war type thing, it's all a bit grey, are, are to be forgiven. So in other words, if you can get away with saying, yeah, this is all part of the war effort, then, hey, you can commit any crime you want. It got to the point where the Kiev star antennas were cut off in the village, local residents say, uh, so on and so forth. So, yeah, typical sort of Kadyrovite um, activity, I guess. Uh, a column of Russian tanks is heading west from Siberia. Now, we see so many, oops, so many examples of huge amounts of Russian equipment being moved into Belarus, out of Belarus, here, there and everywhere. They're putting these from the east, far east of Russia from oh, and the north, I guess, uh, from Siberia. I, what does this say? It says they need equipment and they're getting it from everywhere they can. Oh, it would it does make me wonder like why they hadn't already done this, though. I thought this in a couple of times recently where we've seen equipment move from one place to the other and, and brought to the front line. Why haven't you done that before? Um, anyway, Russian propaganda channels in Telegram increasingly call for a stop of the Bakhmut ex ex uh, sorry, offensive, explaining that Ukrainians already set up several additional defense lines and are having fresh reserves. Bakhmut is becoming unpopular, possibly, in some circles uh, in the back channels of Telegram and, and what have you. Interesting, as they see themselves beating their heads against a brick wall. This kind of happened a little bit down in Pavlivka, in, uh, around the Vukladar area, just to remind you where that is. That's in this area here, where the Russians were beating their head against a brick wall, and then you started seeing people on uh, Russian, you know, pro-Russians on Telegram saying, hey, this isn't just, this isn't good tactics. This is not a good way of doing war. And 
sometimes these opinions gain momentum. If you start seeing them with Russian military bloggers, then the Russian army actually do take on board some of those opinions. Um, first, Melitopol, then Tokmak, and now Kamyanka, and probably every other major city in Zaporizhia, Russian confidence that they might hold the current front line in the south are pretty low. Uh, none of those fortifications I deem useful when facing a mechanized assault force, says Tendar. So this is saying that the Russians are, I showed you this the other day with Tokmak, well, another town in, or city in Zaporizhia Oblast, Kamyanka, has defences built all the way around it. Um, and it just shows you that they're posturing their defence, defensive minds um, uh, indicate what they think is going to happen. So they're starting to build defences around all these uh, cities in in the southern sort of area. Then they are expecting the Ukrainians to attack from the north. Uh, and it also shows that they are defensive minded and not offensively minded. So they are thinking, OK, how do we stop the enemy from attacking us and taking too much territory rather than, OK, where are we going to attack next? How do we get the whole of Zaporizhia or Blast? How do we get Zaporizhia City? They're just not thinking like that. It's like we are going to be attacked. Let's let's think defensively. So I, th uh, I find that very interesting. Um, and HIMARS have been active overnight, Zaporizhia region particularly. Uh, the, on December the 25th, actually this was a couple of days ago, Ukrainian defenders struck a concentration of Russian invaders near Novobilizhka, Bilizhka, in temporarily occupied Zaporizhia region. The enemy lost up to 100 soldiers dead and wounded. Among them are 15 employees of the FSB, the Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation. And just to let you know where that is, that is south of the lakes, uh, and not too far from the nuclear power station at Anodha, uh, so there you go. And Tokmak, I think, was also hit overnight. In fact, here we go. Night in, so this is last night, in the Zaporizhia region, turned out to be hot. The armed forces of Ukraine attacked the Russians in Tokmak, Berdyansk, and Chernihivka uh, areas. The amount of dead and wounded is being clarified. And just to let you know where those places are, so you've got Tokmak, you've got Chernihivka, and you've got Berdyansk. So all in the Zaporizhia region uh, and HIMARS, not unusual, of course, uh, have been very active, causing havoc behind enemy lines. Anyway, let's go on to the front lines. As per usual, we'll start in the northeast. So we'll go from Kupiansk, Svatova, Kremina front line and further down south. What do we have to say about that? Well, uh, positional fighting... It's interesting looking at uh, Rebar, the Russian source, on Telegram this morning, and they've got literally nothing on this entire front line. They kind of start around the Bakhmut area. Uh, they just say there's a little bit about the um, uh, sort of this Svatova front line, just positional fighting continues. Um, it's really interesting. But there you go. In fact, let me see. It says... Uh, Position so it calls it the Liman sector, which is down the Kremlin. Positional fighting and artillery duels along the entire line of contact continue in Liman sector, and that says nothing about really what's going on up north here. Uh, there apparently were repelled Russian attacks, a Russian attacking up north here, uh, around uh, Stenmakivka, uh, around Svatova. But not really any other claims. I mean, the ISW says a Russian military blogger claimed that Russian forces are continuing offensive actions near Svatova and maintaining a stable pace of progress to make measured meter by meter advances. And that just makes me laugh. It sounds like Bakhmut. So meter by meter advances. Russian sources highlighted purported Ukrainian losses near Svatova and claimed that Ukrainian troops are transferring manpower and equipment to the area to compensate for massive personnel losses. So the Russians. Some sources claiming that the Ukrainians are making big losses around Svatova. Um, others, you know, pro-Ukrainian sources claim otherwise. A fighting is ongoing still in Novosilivska, says no reports. The situation in Kolomechika is unclear whether um, after the initial fight two days ago, both parties are quiet. We will just wait out the news. Russia shelled uh, Novomlinsk, uh, Dvorichna, Zapadna, Tabaivka and Borostova. So basically, shelling, position, positional fighting, not a lot of information because I talked to you a few days ago about potential Ukrainian gains all around here, 
all around this this region, just northwest of uh, Svatova, Pidkuychanskir, and around Kuzmivka, they've they've got back into Novoselivska, uh, but uh, and you know the claim that uh, Kolomuychika is now in Ukrainian hands, but just haven't heard anything since. Uh, not a lot to, to report, unfortunately. Um, so then we move on further down south. Uh, to the Kremina area and my there's an awful lot of chatter about Kremina and not a lot of detail. So just to remind you, you've got the P66 highway, 66 highway from Svatova to Kremina. Kremina is uh, here, it's this town at the beginning of this conurbation that stretches through Rubizhna, uh, Sverodonets and L to Lysychansk. Um, there are all sorts of claims. So let's have a look. Uh, Governor uh, says fighting is ongoing near Kremina in Luhansk Oblast. Uh, Ukraine's armed forces are, quote, not far from uh, the city of Kremina and, quote, the fighting is ongoing. Uh, says Luhansk Oblast Governor Haidai on uh, Boxing Day yesterday. Um, the military commander of the Russian occupiers has left Kremina, according to Haidai, which the Ukrainian military is approaching and the fighting is already going on not far from the city. So the military command really has left Kremina. Is That's really important. However, is that sort of propaganda? Are Ukraine laying out foundations of an information space that they want to control. Um, heavy battles continue near Kremlin. The occupying forces are withdrawing a huge amount of reserves and equipment there. Militants are dying there by the hundreds. That's according to Sergei Haidai, again, the head of the Luhansk Regional Ministry, Military Administration. So, so they're pulling out forces and military administration, as according to, to the Ukrainian sources. Heavy battles continue near Kremlin, says War Monitor. Russian forces continue to divert huge amounts of reinforcements to the area. Okay, so now we've, the, we've got this Ukrainian contradiction here. We've got uh, they are withdrawing a huge amount of reserves and equipment there, and the military and administration has left. Uh, and then we've got War Monitor saying Russian forces continue to divert huge amounts of reinforcements to the area. So you always got to watch what, what's being said. Um, and Flash News says, heavy battles continue near Kremlin. The occupying forces are withdrawing a huge amount of reserves and equipment. Their militants are dying by there by the hundreds. So that is the same quote from Haidai, but it, it, it just gives you a little, um, for those who are listening, a little image of him saying that on television. So his, his TV interview where that was said, just trying to work out exactly what's going on. No reports kind of probably sums it up the best, which is the Ukrainians are not inside Kremlin, despite Ukrainian army fan accounts cheering it. So there are a lot of people saying, "Yeah, Kremlin's losing, or it's on is is going to is being attacked, and they're fighting in Kremlin." No, they're not. And that would surprise me if they did some kind of frontal assault like that. Anyway, Chavona Popivka, which is just north of Kremlin, is under Ukrainian control. Zitlivka got shelled heavily today, say locals. Russia attacked Ploshchenko but got repelled, and the Ukrainians are close to Kremlin. Trust them, here he says. So just a, a lot of talk, but not a lot of detail. Zitlivka getting shelled. Uh, unsure whether that is shelled by the Ukrainians or by the by the Russians. It'd be interesting if it's shelled by the Russians, because that means the Ukrainians will have advanced. Uh, Chav Chavona Popivka does seem to be under Ukrainian control now. Lots of people saying that for days. And Ploshchank was a, uh, attacked, which would... Uh, um, implied that that is under Ukrainian control, which I have on my map uh, anyway. Uh, and then we just come further down south, um, past Kremina. V again, as I say, just so much talk, not a huge amount of detail. But just before I do so, just this last line on the area from the Institute of Study War pretty much um, uh, uh, is in line with what I was just saying. Haidai denied reports that Ukrainian forces liberated Krem Kremina and urged patience. Russian military bloggers accused Ukrainian sources of inflating claims of success near Kremlin and called such reports an active information operation, which is kind of what I was saying, laying foundations of that information space. Uh, we, we will see exactly what has happened as the dust settles over the next couple of days. Um, interesting stuff. So as we come to Bakhmut, this is our, our map of Bakhmut. Uh, just to let you know, I've come down from Kremina all the way down there because I don't have an, any information of this front line all the way down to basically until we get to Bilirivka uh, and further along here. Repelled attacks apparently everywhere. So the Ukrainians saying repelled attacks, Bilirivka, Yakolivka, um, east of uh, Bakhmut, Pidorodna, Opit, Nuclis, Chivka, Kodi, Mivka. Okay, 
fair enough. War Mapper says no change in the map of Bakhmut itself. Um, but there are some interesting... Well, let's go to no reports first. So Russia increased its attacks on Bilirivka and west of Yakolivka to outflank Solidar. Also, simultaneously near Bakhmutska, more attacks were reported. I'm going to give you some detail on this because I think that's quite significant. Opitni is under Ukrainian control. Wagner tried to counterattack but got repelled. So that's to say that Opitni down here, definitely under Ukrainian control. And there's, you know, it's looking good for the Ukrainians around there repelled attacks all over the shop but actually up here around Solidar there could be a bit of a problem or at least the Russians have made a bit of an advance so there's a school here I've got this in Ukrainian control here this is all I've rejigged my maps a little bit to show greater Russian control here you can see uh, that that I did have the Ukrainian line here well actually it appears that the Russians are have some kind of significant presence in Solidar and they appear, or they're, at least they're claiming, as you can see from this claim, the Wagner mercenaries ha, are advancing in Bakhmutska and captured a school. They're now developing an offensive towards Solidar. Well, it's in, it, it, well, it's in Bakhmutska towards Solidar being up here. So this school appears to be that school there. Uh, and it looks like the Russians could well have made some decent territorial advances here. I'm not saying this all happened yesterday, uh, but I just haven't updated my maps accordingly yet. Uh, and that is perhaps what it, it, it more accurately looks like. It's just in front of that sort of rail center there. Um, and this is uh, obviously bad news for the Ukrainians because uh, Bakhmut, Bakhmutska and Solidar are really important and the Yakolivka for maintaining a buffer uh, maintaining defences north of Bakhmut, Pidorodny being included in that. So you've got these really important settlements, Yakolivka, Solidar, Bakhmutska and Pidorodna, that the Ukrainians really need to hold the Russians off at, because otherwise they will be able to encircle uh, Bakhmut. And when one goes, perhaps they all go. So this is the idea that Solidar has been somewhat weaker since the, Ukra uh, since the Russians took control of Yakolivka. And that's meant that they can attempt to flank Solidar. And then from Solidar, they can also flank back, flank back Mutska. And so it also kind of potentially could fall like Domino. So this is well worth keeping an eye on because I think this could present a problem for the Ukrainians going forward. Uh, it, ISW reports some stuff here. So Russian military bloggers claim that Wagner Group fighters launched an offensive northeast of Bakhmut towards Solodar and took control of the school between Bakhmut and Solodar and cleared Ru Ukrainian strongholds on the outskirts of Pidorodna. So this is, you know, just down here, outskirts of Pidorodna, as, I, as I've got here. Now, what the outskirts mean, I've just got them uh, in into the very sort of southern outskirts of the settlement there. I know no other detail myself. Social media footage posted on the 25th of December shows Ukrainian troops, fight, troops fighting south of Bakhmut in Opitni. The Russian military bloggers continue to discuss Russian operations in this area. So this is, I think, important. Former militant commander and prominent Russian military blogger Igor Gherkin, whom I've talked about many times, noted that Ukrainian troops have had eight years to prepare defences south of Bakhmut and that Russian forces are unlikely to advance in this area beyond marginal tactical gains, which is possibly to say, uh, let's give up on imagining we're going to make big gains in Opitni. It's, we've been fighting there for some time. They've had eight years to defend it. However, it's looking more bountiful for the Russians north of Bakhmut. Anyway, there you go. That's Bakhmut. So things are happening a little bit, I guess. Um, and uh, Rebar say Russian troops uh, after artillery uh, preparation launched an offensive on the southern outskirts of Solidar. Um, that's what I was telling you. Decisive actions of assault units result in the liberation of several key positions in Bakhmutska. Uh, street fighting continues in the southern suburbs of Bakhmut. The enemy is moving fresh reserves to the front line, including tanks and light armor vehicles. Nevertheless, Russian forces liberating house after house are gradually pushing through uh, Ukrainian defenses. No details there. Does that mean Opitni? Does it mean Kodiumivka or Klyshivka? Uh, no real details. So, um, yeah, uh, take that with a pinch of salt. However, there will be pressure on Klyshchivka and Kody Mivka, of course. Um, let's consider moving south. Right, so zooming out, let's pop down to past New York and Turetsk. Not a lot of detail coming out about there to Avdivka. And really, again, for the for the X day in a row, 
Um, just a number of days of having very limited detail out of Avdivka. It's almost like some kind of stasis there. Positional battles in Povomysky, the front there is stuck for Russia. Uh, and, and that's that. You know, Ariba say uh, not a lot. <laughs> they sort of pop down to Marienka next. So just, yeah, very li limited details coming out of Avdivka. We pop down to Marienka past Krasno Horivka. Uh, and Staromirka Livka to Marinka and the Russians claim so rebar here is, is always interesting because previously claims were they had 80% of Marinka, 90% of Marinka. It's now um uh, Russian motorized riflemen continue to fight a fierce battle with the enemy for the central quarters of Marinka. Okay, so we're back in the center now. Okay. Because yesterday or and the day before, I think it was Rebar themselves saying they were pushing towards the western outskirts. That was the term, the western outskirts of Marinka. And I picked that up and was speaking to you about, well, if it's the western outskirts, it means they're sort of fighting towards here. And now they're saying, oh, they're fighting fiercely in the center. Like, come on, guys, make your mind up. And it just, it just, makes you then doubt the Russian claims so much more than the Ukrainian claims, uh, is, my, is my opinion. I, I could be wrong. Um, hard battles in Marienka, says no reports. The town is one big ruin, but the Ukrainians hold the defence. Also today, reinforcements reportedly arrived, fighting near the city centre and north. And it's got a sort of mini map to indicate uh, that actually things haven't changed from yesterday. It's the same mini map, just a couple of arrows on there. Um, so yeah, fierce fighting in Marienka. Um, in in the north and the centre, uh, again, you know, it's to, it, as they say, it's a ruin there. It's it's an absolute you know apocalyptic scene in Marinka. But there you go. Uh, and then we're down to the Zaporizhia front. Uh, not really any particular detail coming out about that. So the ISW says about this area a repelled attack in Nova Mukhalivka, and that. Uh, Russian sources continue to claim that Ukrainian sources, forces sorry, conducted limited counterattacks southwest of Donetsk City to regain lost positions in the Vukladar area. Uh, no more real detail about that, just general counterattacks around here, one would imagine. Um, and then we uh, sort of carry on to look at Zaporizhia as a whole. Fairly quiet. There's lots of talk uh, on both sides about troop accu accumulations. If we look at ISW again, uh, a lot of talk about, you know, different forces moving stuff around from here to there and what's that tell you. Um, but actually, I want to just talk about what's going on in Kherson. So this is moving to the west here and Kherson with the Dnipro River and Kimburn Peninsula. A few things to say about that. Um, so the ISW... Uh, says, and I'm going to read this out because I think it is of importance, Ukrainian military officials reported that U Russian forces are attempting to conduct small-scale reconnaissance in force operations to reach the right bank of the Kherson Oblast. A uh, spokesperson for the Ukrainian Southern Defense Forces, Humenyuk, also stated that Russian forces are continuing to lose positions in unspecified areas while Ukrainian forces are maintaining artillery fire to prevent additional personnel from reinforcing advanced Russian groupings. Humenyuk added that Ukrainian forces are continuing unspecified combat operations against Russian forces on Kimburn Spit, while uh, Russian forces are continuing their positions on the Spit to shell port areas in Mykolaiv Oblast. Russian forces are continuing to target liberated settlements and Ukrainian positions in the right bank of Kherson, Mykolaiv and Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporizhia Oblasts. Russian forces are uh, also continue to shell the densely populated cities of Bereslav and Kherson. So just uh, interesting that, yeah, places are getting hit, but also that the Russians are attempting to do reconnaissance in force moves onto the right bank. Um, and there's stuff going on on the spit still, just it's completely unspecified. At the same time, there are hits in uh, Kherson Oblast, both uh, artillery and probably HIMARS. I, I talked to you about Zabar, uh, where is it? Uh, one of these yesterday um, in Zaborania. Uh, the strike reportedly injured up to 70 Russian servicemen, but the Ukrainian general staff also reported that Ukrainian strike on an unnamed location in occupied Kherson Oblast, there's a lack of detail there, could cause a bit of suspicion, killed up to 50 Russian servicemen and wounded up to 100 troops. Ukrainian local officials and media, social media users also reported that Ukrainian forces struck Russian military equipment in Olishki, uh, that's on the uh, river, and Chaplinka, which is further back. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so yeah, there is stuff happening, as you would imagine, all around here. 
Um, okay, so that's that's a frontline update. I've got a couple of footnotes I need to add from stuff that uh, I was just thinking about as I was making this in live time. Uh, the first one is that apparently there around Abdivka, just north of Abdivka, there is a fortification that the Russians have taken. So sorry I didn't mention this earlier, but I just had to do in in as I paused. Uh, I just had to go and look at some stuff. I've actually got this under Russian control already, just about. It, it appears that uh, some sources, so this one, has some kind of geolocated fortification in this area. As you can see, that bit of wooded area sort of curls around and comes to the road. Um, so that wooded area curls around and comes to the road. Somewhere around here, there is some kind of fortification that the Ukrainians have lost to the Russians. Um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the original tweet has been removed, the original source, which actually the ISW links to as well. So I just had to do, you know, a little bit of looking around there. Um, not 100% sure of the details of that, but worth considering. And the other thing I want, uh, the other footnote is regarding Chavona Papivka and Dubrova. So yesterday I was saying that War Gonzo re reported that those two places were under Ukrainian control on their map. And that was really good uh, a source to say that actually they almost certainly are under Ukrainian control because War Gonzo doesn't really like to admit these. And so when they do, it's probably true. Defmon then does a bit of digging around here. Says, I believe a lot of the rumors about Dubrovo and Chavana Papivka came from this image posted by Wal Gonzo yesterday. They are notorious for drawing an inaccurate map. They recently showed Russian territory on the right bank of the Dnipro. Um, if you look at the Wal Gonzo map, it looks like Dubrovo and Chavana Papivka are not in Russian control. This does not mean that uh, Ukrainians liberated the settlements. It could be their usual sloppiness, or it could mean the areas are contested. So, really, you're left thinking, well, actually, what's going on? And then he talks about how it was picked up by different sources, so on and so forth. Um, uh, I think Chivana Pivka is almost certainly under Ukrainian control. That's why it's getting shelled. The Brover could be contested. It's all happening around there. There's just a lot of activity around Kremlin. We shall see. Anyway, that's just a footnote uh, to add to that. Thank you so much for your support. Please like, subscribe and share. And I'll try and get a Ukraine war update video out to you later. All the ways you can help the channel are down below in the description. Um, thank you so much. Take care. See you later.